Hey folks and welcome back to my channel. Abdominal exam is a very important skill for all medical students to be able to do proficiently. It's a very important part of both undergraduate and quite a few postgraduate exams and it's a very important skill for pretty much all doctors to be able to, uh, to have. In this video I'm going to go through how to examine the abdominal system. Uh, make sure you stick to the end where I show you how I would do it uh, so make sure you get the best chance to pass your exam. Now before you start kind of diving in and touching the patient, there are a few things that you have to pay attention to and you have to mention in the examination of the abdomen. Um, the first one is exposure. So uh, that's uh, only so much that you can actually do the examination and no more. You don't really need to expose the patient any more than you have to, but essentially you want to uh, expose them from the lower thorax down to sort of the groin area. The other thing you need to pay attention to is the patient's positioning. So they need to be on a nice uh, flat bed in a supine. Uh, if they're at a slight angle, they can potentially be tensing their abdominal wall muscles and that can make it more difficult for uh, you and the patient. You have to mention and you have to pay attention to the patient's privacy and dignity. This is very important. Um, this can be a pass-fail thing in the, in the OSCE, but you have to pay, pay attention to the patient's uh, privacy so you need to draw the curtains that you know, nobody can interrupt and so on. And if you are a, particularly if you're a male student or doctor examining a female patient, but generally as a good practice for all concerned, it's always good to have a chaperone. Um, and as a uh, junior doctor, I used to always uh, get the chaperone to sign with their name and date. Uh, so it's really important to do that, especially if it's a male doctor and a female patient. The other thing to pay attention to is the patient's comfort and general uh, relaxation because if they're kind of awkward and a bit tense then it's going to be a bit more difficult for you, uh, for the patient and potentially for the examiner. The other thing that uh, not everybody mentions and certainly the books mention is a sort of economy of movement, how you conduct yourself in the examination, your banter with a patient, um, how you kind of, uh, the clarity of your instructions and things like that. These things are all very important and examiners pay attention to them. Now before you start you kind of stand back from the end of the bed and take a global view of the whole situation. Not just of the patient, but everything around them. These are things called paraphernalia of disease, so things like drip stands, um, drugs going in, drips coming out, catheter coming out, anything on the board saying kneel by mouth, any food on the side of the bed to give you a clue about the sort of status of the patient. Then you look at the patient and make a comment globally about the patient. So for example, whether the patient's comfortable at rest, whether they are jaundiced, whether they are cachectic, and then you start looking at the hands. Now a pro tip here is not to kind of touch the patient unless and until you have to. So you get them to hold out their hands and say, can I have a look at your hands please? And then you start by inspecting the nails for these things called coilinicia, which is the sort of spoon shaped nails, the reverse curvature of the nail beds, uh, often seen in iron deficiency anemia. You also look for leukonychia, which is the whitening of the nails, the loss of the nail bed uh, distinction between the nail bed and the nail itself. That's to do with low albumin states and liver disease. You look for tar staining on the fingers. Then you inspect the nail beds for clubbing. And the best way to do that is to get them to do this. And you look for the diamond of uh, light between the fingers, fingernails. Then you get them to turn their hand over and at this point you can touch the patient, you can sort of feel in the medial aspect of the palm for uh, this thing called Dupuytren's contracture, which is a thickening of the uh, palm aponeurosis. It can be due to, to do with liver disease, it can be due to manual work and operating the pneumatic drill, or it can be due to, uh, to uh, it can be idiopathic. Uh, you also, while you're in the palm, you check for palm erythema, which is a sort of particular pattern redness uh, of the palms of the hand to do with the hyperdynamic circulation. Uh, it can be physiological, for example, in pregnant women. Uh, then you offer to do the pulse and the blood pressure, and then you move on to the patient's face. And you start by um, sort of inspecting the eyes for any signs of obvious jaundice. Uh, to get a better look, you want to get them to pull their lower eyelid down, or you can do it yourself. And the slick way to do it is to get them to look up to the ceiling and go from below and just gently pull one of their eyelids down because this is a systemic disease, you don't need to do both. Uh, you pull the eyelid down and you have a look at the sclera for any evidence of jaundice. 
while you're there, you can actually look at the conjunctiva for any uh, conjunctival pallor, which is to do with uh, anemia. Then you move on to the mouth. Um, uh, in the mouth, just before you kind of look inside the mouth, you check the corners of the lips for this thing called angular chylitis, which together with this condition, which is called atrophic glossitis, uh, they're both to do with uh, iron deficiency anemia. Again, uh, like Koilinichia earlier, they're not to do with any kinds of any old kind of anemia, so hemolytic or macrocytic. This is to do with specifically iron deficiency anemia, and they get this uh, shiny, smooth, depapillated tongue and the crackings of the corners of the lips, which can be due to um, uh, chronic blood loss, for example, from a colorectal tumor. While you're in the mouth, you check for any evidence of malignancy by checking on the lateral aspects of the tongue or the floor of the mouth for any evidence of uh, mouth cancer, uh, especially if somebody is a, you know, you're checking, for, you know, if have got liver disease and they're a heavy drinker and they're, you know, kind of a high risk of getting mouth cancer. And then you move on to the neck to examine for the uh, cervical lymph nodes. So starting with the uh, submental group, submandibular group, preauricular, posterior auricular just behind and below the uh, ear and the occipital group of nodes and then the deep cervical chain which is anterior to the anterior border sternomastoid. I run my fingers in a broad sweep converging on the sternal notch and if I can't find it I just turn his head slightly to that side and the other side and then I have a feel in the supraclavicular fossas bilaterally and then I take my right hand away to have a feel in the left supraclavicular fossa for a Verkhoff's node. Once you're done with the neck nodes you move on to the thorax or the chest and there are two things you look for in the chest. One is for these things called spider nevi which some most people are allowed a few uh, but if you've got portal hypertension due to sort of liver cirrhosis, you can get quite a few of them. And these are dilated cutaneous arterioles, which means that if you kind of press on them, they blanch and then you let your finger go, the blood, you know, sort of uh, rushes back in. So that's how you know that's an arteriole. It's not just a, a telangiectasia or a, or a pigmented mole. And then in men, uh, obviously, you get um, this thing called gynecomastia, which is uh, feminization of the male breast tissue to do with liver disease and sort of disruption of the liver enzymes. And then you start with the inspection of the abdomen. Now a few things to, you know, to, to mention in the inspection of the abdomen, one is scars, any skin changes, any obvious lumps and bumps, any asymmetry, any kind of ascites or fluid collection or any striae. I'll go through a few of these uh, briefly. Um, it's important to know some of the major uh, abdominal scars, so the median uh, laparotomy or right and left paramedian. Uh, some of them are thankfully rarer now, like for example the right subcostal margin one, the cautious incision, that's very rarely seen. That's the old school way of doing cholecystectomies. Now that's done of course laparoscopically. Uh, you should um, look out for the lands or gridiron scar, which is uh, for appendicectomy. Uh, Fannenstiel or C-section scars in the in the low pelvis um, and various other ones. Of course, don't forget scars can be surgical or can be traumatic, i.e. random and non-anatomical. Here's an example of ascites, so massive fluid collection within the peritoneum, um, an obvious lump in the midline, something like a hernia or striae. After inspection, you move on to palpation, percussion and auscultation. So the best thing is for me just to show you. So let's have a look at that. Hello there. Uh, my name is Amir. I'm one of the medical students here. I've been asked to examine your abdominal system today. This would involve me having a look at your hands and your face, having a look at your belly and having a feed of your belly. Would that be okay with you? That's fine. Do you have any pain anywhere? No, I don't. Can I ask you to confirm your name and date of birth for me, please? Yes, so it's Joe Bloggs, 23rd of the 12th, 1992. Thank you very much. So I'm going to stand back from the end of the bed and just have a look around the bed for any paraphernalia of disease such as a trip stand, a drain, a catheter, um, you know, food, and nutritional supplements, etc. Having a look at the patient, sort of global view, he looks nice and comfortable at rest. He's not cachectic, he's not jaundiced. 
Can I just have a look at your hands for me, please? Sure. I'm just checking his nails for any uh, coilinicia or leukinicia, any evidence of tar staining, and any clubbing. Can I get you to put your fingers together like that for me, looking for the diamond? Thank you. Can I get you to turn your hands over for me, having a feel for any Dupuytren's contracture on the medial aspect, and any evidence of palmar erythema? Thank you. Can I get you to put your arms out for me like this? Uh, put them out like this and then cock your wrist back up and then just give that a few seconds to see if there's any evidence of any hepatic flap. Thank you. At this point I will check his pulse and his blood pressure. Moving on to his face, can I get you to look at the ceiling for me please? Checking his sclera for any evidence of jaundice and his conjunctiva for any evidence of anemia. Can I just have a, a look inside your mouth? Can I, can I get you to open your mouth for me there and pop your tongue out for me? Thank you. So just checking his general oral hygiene, any uh, sort of general lubrication of his mouth, any evidence of angular colitis or atrophic lositis, and any malignant ulcers in his mouth. Moving on to the chest, uh, the inspection of his chest for any gynecomastia and any spider nevi. He's allowed up to five of those in the, in the upper thorax. And moving on to the abdomen, again, just starting with inspection. We're having a look just for any scars any obvious asymmetry, any lumps and bumps, any evidence of distension, any striae, any skin changes. I'm just going to have a feel of your belly, is that okay? That's fine. Do you have any pain? You said you have no pain in your upper. No. So starting from the right iliac, the left iliac fossa, light palpation while looking at the patient's face in all four quadrants, using the most of the palm of my hand to increase the surface area. I'm just going to press a bit deeper now, if that's okay. Okay. Keep looking at the patient's face. Thank you. I'm going to palpate for your liver now, if that's okay. okay. So can I get you to take a deep breath in and out and again and out and again out and again. And out. Thank you. And one more time. Out. I'm going to do the same for the spleen. Deep breath in and out and in and out in and out. Keep going. Thank you. I'm just going to blot his kidneys putting one hand behind his back and having a feel of where his kidney would be. And palpating for any evidence of an uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm, which would be in this area here, above the uh, umbilicus, just to the left of the midline. Just putting my hand there to see if I can feel anything pulsatile. And if I can, to cup it to see if there's any pulsatility. Okay, thank you for that. I'm now going to tap on your belly if that's okay. That's fine. And if I felt a liver edge or percuss the liver edge, I would percuss from the top down to see where the limits of it were. I'm going to do the same for the spleen. I'm just going to check for shifting dullness and I'm going to and if I felt any dullness now can I get you to roll over to my side for me please mm -hmm. thank you and just going to give that a, a few seconds for any fluid to trickle down and then I'm going to have a listen to your belly now, if that's okay. Uh -huh. I'm just going to check in all four quadrants for about five seconds each. And check for a brewery over the abdominal aorta.
Thank you. Uh, at this point, to complete my examination, I would uh, examine his hernial orifices, specifically the inguinal and femoral hernias. I would also do, uh, examine the external genitalia and do a digital rectal examination, and then check for any pitting edema peripherally by palpating over the most distal bony point, which is the medial malleolus, and keeping it for about five seconds, letting go, and if it's positive, find out exactly where it stops by palpating along the anterior border of the tibia. At this point, I would help the patient with his privacy and dignity, thank him, and then turn to my examiner to present my findings. Thank you very much. Thank you. I hope you found that useful. If you did, I'd really appreciate it if you can give it a thumbs up so it helps the channel, helps your colleague discover it. Thank you very much, and I'll see you on the next one.